Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I am very intimidated because that, that keynote was one of the best keynotes I've ever seen this morning. So uh, here I am following that. All right. Well, um, uh, I've had a wonderful time so far in Brisbane. We, we had a great uh, weekend. So yeah, I got to see a couple of these things here. And uh, we also got out on the water and sailed. So it's just been amazing. Um, I'm here to talk about Modern Agile. I'm here to also uh, ask for your help in vanquishing this. Uh, there's a whole lot. It used to be that we were fighting waterfall. And I, and I still think we fight waterfall thinking. Um, but I'm also seeing a whole lot of this stuff out there. And really, the entire purpose of Modern Agile is to inspire people and expose them to better ways of, of working. So that's what Modern Agile is about. Um, now, most of you are familiar with this, right? The sprint. Yes? How many here people do sprinting? OK, ooh, a lot of people sprint. So a lot of you might have experienced this. Um, the beginning of the sprint comes, and uh, you know, you're feeling pretty optimistic. You've made your sprint commitment, and you know, you're, you're optimistic you can get all the work done. But as the sprint goes on, it's not so clear you're going to actually get it all done. And uh, some surprises happen. The thing that you thought was going to take two or three days is going to take six or seven days. Um, there, there's a production incident. Oh my god, we got to go work on that. Um, lots of problems, and, and you're getting beaten up, as, as we do in our field. And um, as it goes and the sprint continues, it gets to be pretty hard to actually achieve the sprint commitment. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And towards the end, you're just angry and you're doing stuff just to get the stuff done because you're on the line to get it done. Typically, it's a, individual tasks have to be completed and your, your, your name is on them and you want to be done. And so by the end, you're doing some horrible things just to get it all done. And this is what I see all over the place, right, with the sprint concept. And it, it, it leads to this, unfortunately. Um, and we don't want too many of those, because if we keep repeating those, we got big problems, right? It's supposed to be a potentially shippable increment, not one of those. Um, my friend John, John Cutler. Um, he refers to the uh, sprints in terms of Tetris. And you're trying to fit all this stuff into the sprint. The problem is things that you're trying to fit in are suddenly getting bigger, right? The scope got bigger because you didn't understand how hard it was to do. Or the production incident comes in. And you're trying to play pr sprint Tetris, and it's just not working very well. So I'm not a big fan of sprints anymore. I used to like them. I also find this is a problem. We have these stories that are so big, right, that they don't get done in the first sprint. So here we go, and oh my god, I've got my, t my, let me take that off real quick. I forgot to turn my Chrome off and shut up my Twitter feeds. So shame on me. Too many um, lines last night, so that should do that. Come on, close, good. All right, that should be quiet now. All right, now where were we? Here we are. The user story is way too big. It's not ever going to get done in the sprint. And so it's going to go from this sprint to the next sprint, and so on. Right? Have you seen this? It's often called scrummer fall, because you're really doing waterfall in the guise of sprints. And it's just it's not agile at all. It's that faux or bad agile. Um, how about this one? Anyone here certified? Anyone here a certified a scrum master? OK, good. Then you can answer this, right? Because you've been certified, you should be able to answer this question, right? A three-hour lunch, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, you know what the answer is? That's the answer, folks. I don't really care about your, your sprint velocity. I don't care about how many story points you get done. These two guys signed the Agile Manifesto, and they also agree. Ron Jeffries created points and said, oops, sorry about that. And Jim Highsmith, who uh, he wrote a book called Adaptive Software Development back in the mid-90s, one of the early pioneers, says it's this, this focus on trying to go fast through the velocity figure is just killing agility. It's really got nothing to do with it. I wrote a whole blog about this called Stop Using Story Points. We stopped using them in my company in 2007. Gosh, 10 years ago. 
I, I, I refer to a lot of what I see these days as the burgers, fries, and coke of the Agile world. The Agile Happy Meal is sprints, stand-ups, and story points. Millions and millions served. Now this is a picture of a product owner I took in Munich. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, he is discovering that a lot of what they're building isn't ever going to get used. Unfortunately, they failed to do some basic validating or invalidating of the ideas frugally at the beginning, rather than just building it and seeing that no one even uses it. Or, God forbid, we have usage metrics on what we're building, so we can actually see if anyone's using this stuff, right? I think product owners should have, first of all, I don't like the role at all, but if we're going to have the role, it'd be nice for them to have statistics. Like, if you come up to me as a product owner and say, I'd like you to build this, I want to know how often are your ideas actually widely used in production? Like, what's your batting average? You know, because um, I think a lot of what we build never gets used. So, to me, the definition of agile is not this. This is what it's become as of the last 10 or 15 years, and it's not this, right? This is really not being agile. So, I'm here to talk about what real agile is. I think a lot of these ideas belong in the sprint care senior living home, the, the stuff that doesn't work, the story points and velocity, and, and uh, yeah, things like sprints, they belong in a senior living home. They had a wonderful lifetime, and now they need to retire. It's not a bad place. They have backlog bingo on Thursday nights, and the food's not bad either. All right, so I want to shift our metaphor here, or shift our way of thinking towards a different way of being agile. And I'm going to use the metaphor of training wheels versus a different approach to learning how to ride a bike. Now, how many of you here learned to ride a bike with training wheels? Show of hands. Good many of you. My hand's up, too. That's how I learned. Now, I have three daughters. The first two I used the traditional approach with, training wheels. The second one, uh, sorry, the third one, my, my youngest, I changed it up. So here's... Uh, a dad in a park near, near our park by our house, and he is helping his daughter learn to ride. There are the training wheels. He was, he was getting them to be higher, because I, I, I gathered that she'd been already using training wheels for a while and, and not really learning how to bike. So he lifted them up pretty high, and here he is at the park. And next, he took the training wheels off, and of course, he's holding her for dear life. Now, this was me teaching my middle daughter how to ride her bike. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm just having fun there. But it's, it's a four-wheeled vehicle. It's not riding a bike. I don't even have to balance. It's four wheels, right? It's just uh, it's not biking. And here she is again, my middle daughter, not learning how to ride a bike. Because the essence of biking is balance. It's not pedaling. It's balance. So for my third daughter, I said, let me try an experiment. And uh, instead of buying one of these, it's a push bike. This is the popular way now, right? This works really, really, really well. Look how simple that is. And look at that nice little uh, logo, too. No, I'm kidding about that. But um, I didn't buy one of these because I'm cheap and we already had a bike. So I was like, just don't use the pedals. OK, so here's Eva over a 24-hour period. We went to the park two times, so afternoon and in the morning, and she was riding her bike. Let's just watch. <laughs>
Okay, you got the idea basically. She learned in one day how to ride her bike, right? Um, the, the focus was the essence of biking, which is balance. The, the pedaling part, no big deal. This is how most kids now I see around in, where I live in Berkeley, California, are now learning. The future arrived a long time ago. It just hasn't been evenly distributed. And I think this is the case with modern agile. And, and again, what is modern agile? It's, it's, it's the things people are doing that are far better than what we used to do in the past. So modern agile is four principles, and they are make people awesome. I believe that you cannot be agile if you don't know what, where you're going. You need to have a purpose. You need to know what you're trying to achieve. And modern agile says, how about making the customer awesome? And also, how about making the people we work with awesome too? Right? So modern agile is very clear about this. You have to have a purpose, and we say, why not go for awesome? We think it's impossible to become awesome if you're not safe. Safety is critical in our world. It's critical for high performance. It's critical for our consumers or users. It's even critical inside the company via the psychological safety we have, the safety to make a mistake, the safety to disagree. So making safety a prerequisite is recognizing the incredible importance of safety in our work. We also don't know how to make people awesome because we don't even know what that means for them. We have to experiment and learn rapidly, right? If you read anything about Lean Startup, for example, very, very focused on the scientific method, on having hypotheses, testing them, uh, iterating on, on that. Um, a big part of what ought to be in backlogs is a bunch of assumptions and how are we going to validate or invalidate those assumptions with experiments. And finally, delivering value continuously. How can we work in a way where we're not stockpiling work and um, in lean terms, it's just pure waste before a customer has it. How do, we, how do we optimize that pipeline and get stuff out to people quickly? Deliver value continuously. So these are four principles. Um, let's go back to what does agile really mean. From the dictionary, one of the definitions is having a quick, resourceful, and adaptable character. Quick, resourceful, adaptable, right? That's the definition of agile. Now let's look at an example. Um, this is an e-learning product we build. I believe that if you're going to be a good software consultant or agilist, you need to have your hands thoroughly dirty in doing this stuff, and we, we have. So we built an e-learning product to help teach test-driven development and refactoring and various skills, and building that software has taught us a lot of things. We've experimented on our own process there. So we had a musical metaphor. We sell albums and box sets, and there's playlists, and there's a nice metaphor there. And we thought that like musical style um, navigation buttons would actually be a good thing. Turns out no one understood what the hell they were. So um, I basically said, I'm going to experiment and learn rapidly, right? I'm going to um, take some image from one of the pages. I'm going to throw it up on a website called The Click Test, where random strangers will look at your image, look at a question you give them, and then click somewhere. So I tried it, right? Now, if you can notice, there's a little four here. You happen to be on page four. And my question was, where would you go to click to get to page eight? OK, that's where they clicked. That's the wrong button. You're not supposed to click that button. Um, and so 88% of people clicked on the wrong place. Oops, OK, fine. I better change the design. So I also changed the question. I thought, maybe it's a bigger hop. What if you're going from page 20 to page 40? OK, cool. I also changed the uh, design. Now, I didn't do this with programming. I just went into my painting pro paint shop program and modified it a little bit. You can still see elements of the old buttons there. Um, I just said contents, th thinking that they're just going to get it, right? And they click, they click there. That's an information display. What are they doing? There's nothing clickable there. Jesus Christ, 82% uh, wrong. All right, fine. I've only burned a few minutes, right? I'm into this 10, 15 minutes at this point. So I thought, OK, they're kind of thick. I'm going to have to make this, this, this contents button much more um, bold. So I went with orange. And uh, there we are. Um, and you know, I basically found that they still clicked there. I'm like, OK, they're telling me something. They're telling me something. I'm going to have to listen to my users. And so I had another question, and then I put the damn thing up there. It looks horrible. I'm not a graphics person, right? It doesn't even look like a real scroll bar. But it, 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 it did the job, because that's what happened. <laughs> and I got my 77%. Now, 
We didn't end up using this design. We ended up getting something even better. But the point is, I'm trying to show you, we experiment and learn rapidly today. That's what we do. We find ways to do that in, in being agile. Um, if I studied what I did, there was no sprint, right? It was just, we have to fix navigation. We've seen too many problems with it. And so we were working on it. No sprints. The work took about an hour and a half to actually figure out a better design. Um, very low cost experimentation. No development work. I was simply using a paint shop program and a very high speed learning, okay? Another definition of agile. This is probably my favorite, the one I've memorized. Marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace. And again, you'll see the word quick in there, right? Remember having a quick, resourceful, and adaptable character, right? This one's marked by ready ability to, to move with quick, easy grace. Um, if it's just quickness alone, we got a problem, because you can quickly go in the wrong direction. But if you're moving with quick, easy grace, I think you're moving beautifully in the right direction. Um, back to our albums, here are the albums, and um, people would start to say to us, you know, I'm on a page in the e-learning and I want to resume from where I left off. A very reasonable request. And we heard enough people requesting this that we didn't even have to validate or invalidate this particular requirement. It was a requirement, okay? We got to build this. Here you're on a page, you want to return to that page after you've logged out or, or timed out, great, we'll bring you right back there. Okay, so we started building this. Now at the time this was about 2010, and we had already implemented continuous deployment, which we absolutely loved. Now how do you implement a feature in a modern way with continuous deployment? We said, okay, cool, here's what we're gonna do. Um, this is the student resume study um, story. We have the user interface, the domain logic, and the persistence. We started with persistence. We said, hey, let's just start recording the data in the database, right? So we test drove the logic to record data into the database for the last page the user was on. And we put it into production. It's generating data, excellent. The data was slightly off because we really needed a little bit of business logic there. There's some, slight, there's some weird cases where you have to know exactly what page to save. There's playlists and box sets and things like that. So I won't bore you with the details, but we had to test drive the logic in the, in the, in the domain logic and then we ship that as well. So now we're saving better data into the database. We cleared out the old data, and uh, there we are. We're saving better data. Still no interface, still no feature live yet, but the feature's growing through continuous deployment. And finally, we developed and deployed a user interface. The first thing we did was we only exposed it to ourselves, right? The people in my company who could see it, and we played around with it, looked at it, and said, that's eh, kind of ugly, let's make it prettier. Eventually, we made it prettier and uh, we exposed it to everyone. But before we did that, we first said, and this, this is what it ended up looking like, right? So when you log in, you can resume from where you left off. Um, we also said, let's measure usage. So we know how many people are actually using this. Remember my, my product owner from Munich? We didn't want to look like him. So we measure usage. And uh, after a few weeks, we saw that about 36% of people were using the resume feature. So that made us feel pretty good that yes, our work is valuable. Um, if I grade myself on this stuff here, again, there was really no sprints. This thing took about three and a half days of work. Um, we just work on small things all the time, right? We have stuff to do and it's all small and we just work on it. And it doesn't matter if, if, if priority comes in, it can just easily you know, push the other stuff away. We'll work on that. We haven't done a ton of work to plan things for a two week sprint anymore. We just find that to be wasteful. As long as we have really small important things to work on, that's what we do. Um, Continuous deployment was critical to, to us working in this style, and we saw that we had high feature usage. We also did a bunch of huddles. We don't do stand-up meetings. We just huddle all the time when we need to talk, and there's no prescribed set of, of uh, questions to ask ourselves. We simply talk about what's important. Sometimes people crack jokes in the huddles. It's kind of fun. So the Manifesto for Agile Software Development basically was saying that we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. It's a perfectly good thing to say. It's a valuable thing to say. It's very focused on software development. Now what I see in these days is that people like this stuff. Um, we've had companies where we're building software and they also build their own hardware and they say, could you help the, uh, the hardware people become more agile? Sure, we'll work with them too. The same principles apply. This stuff, a lot of this came out of lean, lean manufacturing and Toyota, right? Perfectly applies. We've had sales and marketing people want to learn this stuff. We've had HR people want to learn how to be more agile. 
Um, there's a story of a, of a lawyer at General Electric who, who took a 28-page partner agreement and got it down to two simple-to-read legal pages. If you want to have partnerships and make them really fast, get a new partner up and running, a two-page document tends to be a lot better than a 28-page one. We can be lean and agile in many, many ways. So modern agile says we're uncovering better ways of getting awesome results. That's what we're focused on. It's much broader tent. The tent is a lot bigger. It's not just software development. I've been influenced by many wonderful books in, in coming up with Modern Agile. Um, Badass by Kathy Sierra, Making Users Awesome, a fantastic book. I won't name all these books, but um, there's continuous delivery, and we have Dave Farley in the audience here, so that's, you owe me later on for a beer for that one. Uh, so uh, we have Lean Startup, of course, a pivotal book and bestseller. Um, and then some books here that are all about safety. Um, I love Sidney Decker's books. Anyone here know Sidney Decker? Some names, yes. So absolutely amazing stuff that he does around safety culture, around resilience engineering, safety two versus safety one. There's wonderful, wonderful stuff in there that totally applies to our field. Um, and okay, going back here, Modern Agile is really focused on outcomes. We want to focus on an outcome, right? Not on outputs. Velocity figures are outputs, story points and things. How many stories did you get completed? Who cares? Are you achieving an outcome? Are you making anyone awesome? That's the important thing. Got to focus on that. We've been translating uh, this to various languages, interesting stuff. Um, it's been used at various companies. This company uh, is eBay. They love Modern Agile, and many other companies are starting to just Simplify. They've already been through years and years of trying other methods, um, and they're finding the four simple principles in Modern Agile resonate with a lot of people. Um, they made it into Agile in a nutshell. This person here, this, this company, they brought it to their offsite and had a spinning wheel, so that was kind of fun. Very quickly, I'm Josh Karyevsky. I'm the founder of Industrial Logic. I started this company in 1996. My idea was to help bring the magic of software development skills to, to the, a larger uh, world, and uh, that's what we still do today. So I got involved in extreme programming in the late 90s, started doing a lot of agile coaching, and wrote a book. How many people have refactoring to patterns? Anybody? Okay, you have a lot. Many of you have to own this book. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, IXP was an attempt to sort of help companies scale this stuff, and we didn't call it scaling. It was just that we found ourselves doing extreme programming in very large enterprises and it was insufficient. It was very weak on the product management side, on the uh, organizational side, right? So we had to sort of invent some things, and there's some stuff in there we still do to this day. Um, E-learning is some things we've, we've spent a lot of time building, and I invented a word back in uh, 2013. Now, if you're a consultant and you don't have an obscure Japanese word that you say all the time, you're nobody. So I, I found a Japanese word that applied to what I was talking about, which was onzen. Onzen, not onsen, onsen is hot tub. Onzen is safety. And so I invented a term called onzeneering, which is about building safety in all the time. And no one knew what the heck I was talking about, so I stopped using that word. All right, most of you here have been just being very patient with me, saying, Josh, wonderful, but how does this scale? Everyone cares about scaling these days, right? So I'm here to show you that modern agile actually scales. And I have proof, let's watch. I don't think I have to say anything else. But what I am going to say is this, that smart organizations scale principles. They don't scale frameworks. They don't scale methodologies. Um, they scale principles. That's what's important. Um, fastest company to reach 100 billion in annual sales, Amazon. Principle driven. We're going to talk about Amazon. AWS got to 10 billion a year in annual sales faster than Amazon itself. Pretty scary. And Jeff Bezos says that they share a distinctive organizational culture that cares about and acts with conviction on a small number of principles. And he really means this. If you read their shareholder letters, Amazon shareholder letters, going back to, I've started with 1997, you'll see these principles at work. He was talking about them back then when they were just selling books. Customer obsession rather than competitor obsession. 
I put the heart symbol there, which is make people awesome, because I think that's related. Customer obsession. An eagerness to invent, simplify, and pioneer willingness to fail. Jeff Bezos has said that Amazon is one of the greatest places on earth to fail. They totally accept it. Professional pride in operational excellence. If you order something from Amazon, you're going to get it. You can, you can return it with operational excellence. You can use their web services with operational excellence. They're focused on operational excellence. Very important. And finally, treating others respectfully and patience to think long term. I wouldn't say uh, Amazon you know, has a wonderful ability to say to Wall Street, you know, go screw off. We don't care if you want us to show profits. Right? They have this patience to think long term. I think that makes them very safe. Treating others respectfully, I don't know. I've never worked at Amazon. I hear stories that are both good and bad sometimes about the work conditions. So I don't know, um, you know if we can give them an A grade on that one. Facebook's another company where um, I think these same modern agile principles apply. They have five particular principles they drive themselves on. Being bold, right? Got to be bold if you're going to make someone awesome. They really value that. Focusing on impact. How are you going to have a great impact on, on the world? Um, moving fast. It used to say move fast um, and break things. In the early days of Facebook, it was move fast and break things. They've matured a bit, so now it's move fast with stable infrastructure. You can see the idea of, of make safety a prerequisite there. Be open. OK, so there's more about that on their website that describes what they mean by being open. But for a, a, a big chunk of it, it's Hey, the employees need to be knowing what's going on with the company. Transparency. You can't feel safe making decisions if you don't understand where the company is and where the company is going. Be open about things. And finally, building social value is adding to the to they, they view their job as being something for the entire world, not just for Facebook. All right, now I think principles or values can be easily abused, right? These are Enrons um, for values, right? Now, I remember being just wonderfully excited when Enron was going down. Because all of a sudden, there were thousands of these chairs. This is the Henry Miller Enron chair. It's an expensive item, and I wanted one. And they were on sale, thousands of them, because Enron did not actually care about their principles or values. They'd gone deeply into criminal uh, activity and done anything they possibly could to try to make their stock price keep going up until they were caught. So you know, if you don't follow your principles, um, which is what most companies do, right? most companies simply put these things up on the wall and ignore them. Right? It's companies like Amazon and others that, uh, and Facebook and others that, that really take them seriously. So let's talk about the four principles of modern Agile. Make people awesome. What does this mean? All right, so my daughter said, it's my birthday coming up, Dad. I'd like to have a water balloon fight. Now, those words, a water balloon fight, they just made me feel awful because I knew that I'd have to sit there by the, you know, the sink making water balloons. It's very difficult to make water balloons, right? You have to get all the water in. You gotta, you're all wet. You've got to sort of tie the knot. It's, has anyone done this? It's, it's painful, right? And I'm, I'm not going to say no to this little character here, it's like, of course you can have a water balloon fight. Oh my god. All right. But then I discovered something that a couple of Kiwis created, which made me awesome, made Eva awesome, made her friends awesome, and it made everyone awesome. It was just fantastic. Here it is. Modern balloon, water balloon. Show it, show it. Take more. All right, I didn't know how many, I didn't know when to turn it off. One of them popped, but the rest were fine. And there were several other of these, so we made about 150 water balloons in about two minutes with almost no pain. It was fantastic. And the water balloon fight was incredible. She had a blast, the kids had a blast. I realize this is a first world problem. It's, it's not even, it's a zeroth world problem. Um, but the thing is, how amazing of these Kiwis, it's a brother and sister entrepreneur, 
who created this, this particular toy is considered, it won awards around the world for being one of the best toys ever that year. And it's just something I never even thought I needed. So Sense and Respond is a book that basically says, understanding the unexpressed and unmet needs of customers is key to unlocking value, right? I never thought to ask for this thing. There's a lot of unexpressed ideas and unexpressed needs that your consumers or, or customers or users have that you can hopefully learn about so you can create the kind of uh, product that those, twi those, those Kiwis made. Here's smart reply from Google. I use this all the time. I'll get an email and it'll be basically just easy for me to respond, but instead of typing, I can just usually hit one of these three buttons and then press send. Now, I might use it 15% of the time, but it makes my life better, right? They've thought, hey, let's save Josh some time. Let's make it less painful to keep responding to emails. So I love this feature. They use machine learning to generate these particular items. Um, it's, it's just a nice thing they're doing for me that I ne never asked for, never thought about. In this book, Kathy Sierra basically says, the problem a lot of companies have is they focus on making a great product. And that sounds like, why would that be a problem? Well, she says the real focus needs to be on making a great user of that product. If you make cameras, don't make the world's greatest camera, make the world's greatest photographer. This is consistent with Amazon's obsessing over the customer, right? How can we make the customer awesome? Kathy's saying the same thing. She said, make users awesome. Her words inspired make people awesome in modern agile. And we just made the bar even higher to say, not just your users or consumers, also the people you work with. Who are those people? Well, in selling our e-learning, we learned a lot. We learned that, you know what? There's people that just evaluate the e-learning. They're never really gonna go through it as a student, but they're gonna evaluate it in terms of making a buying decision. How can we make their experience awesome? It's different from a user's experience or student's experience. How can I make the buyer awesome? If someone at a very well-known company buys hundreds of thousands of dollars of RE learning, and then nobody uses it, it's shelfware, that person is going to have a black eye in the company. I don't want that to happen. So how can I make their experience awesome? What's the rollout gonna look like for the e-learning? There's an entire ecosystem of people you have to think about if you're gonna make people awesome. Make safety a prerequisite. It's not this. I'm not saying to live in a cave. I'm not saying to add a whole bunch of padding around yourself so that you don't try and take any risks. Not taking risks is really risky. So it's not that. At Etsy, they had a site outage. An engineer, his seventh day on the job, he saw a CSS file that he thought wasn't being used. Turns out it was only being used for Internet Explorer. He deleted it, they do continuous delivery there at Etsy, and it made it into production. What happened was, when they did try to show that page for Internet Explorer, it couldn't find the CSS file. And so it just tried to show the error file, the error page. Well, the error page also relies on the same CSS file. And so we had the infinite loop, and Etsy's down. Normally, when sites like this go down, and you're losing millions of dollars in revenue, this is what happens, right? Lots of anger, lots of blame. Not at Etsy. People are not afraid of failure, they're afraid of blame. Seth Godin said that, right? Is your culture one of blaming people? That's not gonna lead to a lot of learning. The leader's job is to drive out fear. W. Edwards Deming. It's really funny, I just wrote a blog and I, I accidentally wrote our fear. Drive our fear. Ugh, I fixed that immediately. Um, but drive out fear, that's the leader's job. Wonderful. I said this at a conference. If, a, if you have a culture of fear, none of this agile stuff, none of these principles and practices are really gonna help. Not in a culture of fear, you will be continuously mediocre. Etsy, the site's down, what happened? Well, this, this programmer, seventh day on the job, and he wasn't even a beginner programmer, this is an intermediate to advanced programmer, he won the three arm sweater award. The three arm sweater award is given once a year, it's, it's accidentally you're knitting a sweater and you knit a third arm by accident, so it's very, very interesting. Uh, it's given to the person who makes the biggest mistake, and what they did was they, they had a blameless retrospective, and they said, wow, 
how could we have created a website or, or, uh, where deleting one file brings the whole thing down? Shame on us for having such a fragile ecosystem. Thank you, programmer, for exposing this. It's wonderful. How can we now redesign it so it's, it's much more uh, resilient? And that's how they welcomed him in the company. He was not treated like a leper. He wasn't sent to training. He wasn't given another assignment. He was welcomed to Etsy and thanked for the, the teaching them something about um, the mistake they made in their design. Fascinating. So Google said that psychological safety was the number one thing they found in their highest performing teams. You might have heard this before. Anyone aware of Project Aristotle? So if you've read about that, this has been shown widely. I was, it was wonderful to come across this because I'd been talking about safety for a while and I said, yep, there it is. There's proof from Google that psychological safety in the team is utterly important for being high performing. So what does it mean to have psychological safety? I say it exists when you're not afraid to be yourself, take risks, make mistakes, raise problems, ask questions, or disagree. If this is present, you have high psychological safety. In most places, it's not quite all there. People could be afraid to take a risk because they're fear of making a mistake. People could be afraid to disagree with a superior because that might make them look bad or get them fired. We have a lot of fear in our organizations and it's holding us back from high performance. What Modern Agile says is we have to make safety a prerequisite. That means we have to focus on creating things like psychological safety. Another thing we do is tailboarding. I'm going to show, there's, there's tons of ways you can bring safety into your work, whether it's software development or another industry. In software development, we started doing tailboarding. This is a name that comes from other industries. Uh, workers at an electrical site where they're changing the electricity up on the wires, they'll gather around at the site the tailboard is the, the, the pickup truck, right, where it's open at the back and they're all certain stand, standing around. And they look at the site and they look around and they say, now what could go wrong on this job? What are some possible risks we might face? How could we mitigate those risks? Is there a barking dog over there who might start, you know, running at us? Well, what, what's going to happen? Tailboarding for us on our Kanban board is a chance for us to say, we haven't started the work yet, but what could go wrong on that particular user story before we begin working on it? I um, believe that, so another thing I've learned from people in the safety industry, people that are, are actually helping others become safe is in high hazardous industries, they carry these stop work authority cards around. The stop work authority card, I hold one in my pocket at all times, it enables you to stop any unsafe work, anything that you deem to be unsafe to yourself or to others, you can hold the card up and say, stop. It's simply the same as pulling the and on cord at Toyota, all right? But it's for knowledge workers. And I give this to all of my employees, and we've used it on each other. I've had it used on me, I've used it on them. We have a Slack version, electronic version we use in Slack. Um, sometimes it's misused, right? I've been up, sometimes woke up at 4 a.m. My, my friend in, in uh, Brazil sends me a message saying, what are you doing up at 4 a.m. working? Stop. I'm like, no, it's okay, Miguel. I'm just, I'm up, and I'm working, and I'm happy. Uh, so it's, however, we've had people with the one guy, he ended up having a root canal the next week. But that, that first, that week, he was saying, I'm going to a client next week. And someone said, Tim, stop. You are not going to the client next week. Uh, you have pain in your tooth. It turned out to be a root canal. You have pain, and you're not, you're not set for going next week. We're going to get someone else to go. So it's used in all kinds of interesting ways that I can't even um, predict, but very, very useful for establishing safety. This is mod programming. We love mod programming. Um, we use this. This is at a Fortune 10 company in the USA that we're doing this. And we have multi-mob, several mobbing stations. Incredible way to be focused to build awareness and knowledge transfer with people. These, this is a very high performing team at an automotive company uh, in Detroit. I think you have to visualize things to be safe. If you don't think your project's going too well, well, one of these things, this comes from FDD, invented in Australia, Feature Driven Development. It's a, a board where you can see how you're doing on a whole bunch of different things for your project or product. 
Psychologically safe meetings. These are five things we find are very interesting. And I believe that starting with psychological safety is difficult. So I say, hey, how about in your meetings, agree to be psychologically safe? Start there. Start there. Start to agree. Everyone gets to contribute if they want to. We're going to really listen and not be on our devices. We're going to even prove that we're listening by repeating or reviewing points. We are not going to dominate or interrupt folks. I see many times wherever I go, women get interrupted a lot during meetings. Not just women, men do too, but I see a lot of women getting interrupted and I don't like it. It, it, it stops them from wanting to contribute um, their ideas. They shut down. Don't do that. Um, be curious, caring, non-judgmental, right? Curio approach things with curiosity rather than contempt when someone says something you don't like. All right, experiment and learn rapidly. This guy here, very wealthy man, Warren Buffett, learn more, earn more. Um, this guy here, what happened, Jeff? Nobody, does anyone here have the Amazon Fire Phone? No one got it. Barely anyone bought it. It was an absolute disaster. And, you know, this is a superstar businessman. So a journalist said to him, hey, Jeff, <laughs> what happened? And you know what he said? He said, are you kidding me? We're working on much bigger failures right now. And he went on to say, we are 100 billion plus in annual sales, 250,000 people the size of our mistakes grows along with that. In, in my own small company, I'm inspired by Jeff. I'm like, oh, what mistakes have we made lately? Are we not making any mistakes? Are we not failing? Because if we're not, we're probably not pushing hard enough. Now let's make some mistakes that are affordable for us, right? But important for learning. And a lot of what they learn in the Fire Phone, I believe, has been incorporated into the Amazon Echo. So really, your failures can teach you a heck of a lot. This guy here, incredible uh, comedian, goes around the world giving fantastic sold out arena performances. He starts in his tiny little club in New Jersey and he has a legal pad filled with jokes. And he sits there, he's not animated like Chris Rock typically is, sits there and just goes through scientifically joke after joke to see if it elicits any, any laughter. He's experimenting and learning rapidly. This is a retrospective timeline that is a team's ability to learn every day. Instead of waiting for the, a two-week sprint to end and do a retrospective, they're doing it every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What's working well? What needs improvement? Continuous retrospectives. This guy here considered one of the greatest uh, inventors of the uh, 20th century, and he solved the gossamer, uh, the, he solved human-powered flight, right? Human-powered flight. How can you go up in the air, fly in a figure eight for one mile, and land safely, all under human power? He and a team in Southern California solved this problem. It's called the Kremler Prize to solve it. it. Took 17 years. No one could solve it. He solved it by creating an airplane that was built to fail. It, it would fail, and they could redo it several times a day because it was, it was made of materials that were easy to replace, lightweight, um, and built to fail built for failure. That's how they learn rapidly, experimenting and learning. Deliver value continuously. Um, I was very inspired by a, a, a speech that Timothy Fitz gave. Timothy Fitz worked for Eric Reese, who wrote the Lean Startup book, and they were at that company where Eric started this. And the, this, this talk was doing the impossible 50 times a day. What was the impossible? It was delivering to production, on average, 50 times a day to millions of users. Absolutely incredible. I didn't know about continuous deployment in 2007, and my mind was blown. We've learned since then how to make it safe to deploy. So you talk about make safety a prerequisite and, and deliver value continuously. Those principles go together. How do you make a safe deployment pipeline? Evolutionary design, another really critical agile practice. If you really want to be agile, um, Simon Brown, I think, used this in his talk on architecture for developers. Learning to build a primitive thing first and evolve it over time is a critical skill in delivering value. You start with a very primitive whole. This is not strings that one team made that are over there and the head over there by another team and then the body there by another team. It's an integrated primitive whole. 
And that applies whether you're working on a tiny little story or a giant product. How do you start with a primitive first? Um, I'll skip this, but basically it's uh, showing with a chopping cart how you go from primitive to sophisticated over time. That's how we do things. And we see the highest value comes from the meat of the story, not the bells and whistles, which you can kind of ignore till later. All right, to conclude, the Manifesto for Agile Software Development, written in 2001, it said customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Very important thing. We want to be collaborating with our customer. Modern Agile goes much further and says, we want to make our customer awesome. Not just collaborate with them. We want to make them awesome. And we want to make our colleagues that we work with awesome as well. The manifesto said, working software over comprehensive documentation. And working software is very important. A lot of places I go, they can't even get that far. But we want to go further. We want to deliver value continuously. How can we do that? Sometimes working software is not what we want. Sometimes delivering value is invalidating an idea. We don't want to build any software. I want to go up and uh, do the click test and find out that my navigation is terrible and what can I do about it? That's delivering value. It's not working software. We deliver value in all sorts of ways, right? So focus on delivering value every single day. Responding to change over following a plan. Very important when you have a waterfall approach and you have a giant specification and you're trying to be responsive to changes to that big spec. Responding to change was a waterfall driven reaction. Modern Agile is transcending this all together and just saying, let's drive change. Let's experiment and learn ourselves. So we're the ones driving the change. We're not waiting for the business to change their mind about something. We are one group together working on something, experimenting on it, learning from it driving change. And finally, individuals and interactions, our field, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I can't tell you how many places I go where they're very proud of the fact that they just bought a very expensive enterprise agile tool and they've rolled it out to everybody. We haven't even done this very well. But I say this is much way more important. Make safety a prerequisite. How can we make safety a prerequisite to be excellent? We want these interactions with our individuals, whether they're our consumers or our colleagues, to be safe. That leads to higher performance. So these are good things. I'm not saying the manifesto has bad ideas in them at all. I'm saying maybe we can update it and think about the larger tent that we're in today. People are telling me that the modern Agile principles are easier to explain to people in general, especially non-software people. So consider uh, explaining Agile through these four principles. If you want to learn more, this is a .org. Everything about Modern Agile is um, open source. The fonts, the icons, you can download all this stuff. We have a little spinning wheel that's fun to put on your phone. ModernAgile.org to learn more. By the way, I brought a bunch of stickers. If you want a sticker, I have some. I also have these little stop work cards, so I can give you some of those. Modern Agile Show is a show on YouTube that I, uh, I make occasionally, and it's, uh, it's filled with fun interviews and other topics to learn more. And that's it. I don't know if we have any time. Uh, happy to take questions after this, so thank you.